Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamualaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni moni wanji, namaste, jambo. Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful city of Orlando in the great state of Florida. We are so honored and so happy that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. And please tell all of your family and friends about the show. Our guest today is Amy Sarah King. She's here to celebrate her middle grade novel, Attack of the Black Rectangle. Before we invite our guest into the studio, we want to invite you to join us at the Orange County Children's Book Festival in Costa Mesa, California on October 2nd. The Orange County Children's Book Festival is the largest children's book festival in North America. It's incredible! There are hundreds of authors, all sorts of totally interactive shows. We'll be there with our booth. You get to meet me. You get to meet some of the books that we've celebrated here on the podcast. You get to be part of our totally interactive family magic show. And we're going to be looking for some great families to interview to be part of a future episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Caught past that, that. Easier said than done. The Reading With Your Kids podcast. It's, it's fun. It's easy. It's free. Free admission. October 2nd. Uh, the Orange County Children's Book Festival. Come on down. We are going to have a great time today. Join us right now from central Pennsylvania. Our guest is here today to celebrate her middle grade novel. It's called The Attack of the Black Rectangles. Please welcome to the show, Amy Sarek King. Hey, Amy, how are you? What is up, Jen? I am so happy to be here. I just can't tell you. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to have you on. We discovered in our little brief chat before we started recording that we have a lot of uh, shared interest and love, and that is always so cool. And right now, um, if you were to walk upstairs to uh, to my kitchen and sit down at my table, there is a copy of The Attack of the Black Rectangle sitting on our table, absolutely baffling my wife because she's like – what is it with all these black rectangles on there? What, what is this? And so why don't you tell us what, what's Attack of the Black Rectangles all about? Well, um, to answer both questions <laughs> about what are the rectangles about, um, it's about book censorship. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the simplest answer. But, but on a, on a, for the longer thing, it's, it's about Mac Delaney. He's going into sixth grade. And he encounters a book uh, in the first month of school a school book that he's been given to read that has some areas blacked out with Sharpie marker. And so he and his two friends, Marcy and Dennis, um, start on a journey to figure out, well, what the words are, who blacked them out, what they can do about it, you know, and really research the idea. Um, And I think that, well, we'll get into that in a minute, like, because the idea of why the person censored the books is opens a larger social conversation. Um, but there's also black rectangles that Mac puts, puts on his feelings and his life. Um, and, and there's things in his life that are complicated that he hasn't quite faced or, you know, processed yet, I guess I shouldn't say faced, but processed. And so there's, so there's, there's a metaphor in that too, but, but at its core, it's about book censorship. You, you know, as you were mentioning reading the book and finding words that have been blacked out as a, well, forget about as a middle grader, um, as an old man, that is the first thing that I want to do is find out what that word is. (laughs) So to me, the idea of of, of trying to censor a book in this way, it's absolutely ridiculous because it just draws attention and heightens interest in whatever it is you're trying to hide. Absolutely. It also, right. So in this, in this situation, it, the book that was censored um, is called The Devil's Arithmetic by Jane Yolen, a fantastic novel about the Holocaust. And so the first bit of censorship is right in the middle of a really hard scene, a really serious scene um, that, that takes place at, at a concentration camp, you know, and it's, it's very good age appropriate history. It's a fantastic book, won many awards. Um, and so 
it not only makes you curious to find out, oh, what's the word? So it becomes the most important part in the paragraph, mm -hmm. right? When in actual fact, that scene in that paragraph is really the thing that's supposed to be, you know, um, ingested by the reader. So, so it, it, it distracts in so many ways. And, and for why, you know, like, for what reason? Um, and I think that's, that's really, in a way, what the book ends up being about, because these kids feel very undermined, and they should. Mm -hmm. um, they feel like that adult who censored the book didn't, didn't give them the credit to have the, the minds and hearts and the grace to accept the realities of that scene. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I learned uh, as a parent when my kids were in that middle grade age I was a lot of things in my life happen. It seems by accident, but I think they're divinely inspired. But I was taking a class in media literacy for a bigger, bigger program, uh, and and it was a very interesting class. It was taught by a Catholic nun, and so when it came to ideas of of books and inappropriate content, I'm I'm going into the class thinking, oh, she's going to tell me to to don't let my kids read this and that and that, and quite the opposite. She said. Don't try to ban anything because you're just going to make it more interesting to your kids. Instead, sit down, consume the media that you're concerned with, with your kids, and then talk about it. Yes. And that was genius. Yes. I'll tell you what. The older I get, the more I realize my mother, and my mother's an educator, um, and she was so smart with that because when we were kids, she read the news, but she still reads the newspaper every day. And, but she'd read the newspaper every day. And no matter what age I was, she would say, Hey, come over here, read this. And she'd point to an article, just random. Not, and this wasn't every day, but it was every now and again. And she, so I'd read it. And so right there, she's, she's checking out my skills. Right. So, I mean, you know, you gotta love it. Like teachers are born assessors and this is why I have opinions about standardized tests, but whatever. <laughs> um, so I'd read it and then she would turn to me and she would say the most magical words ever given to young people, which is, what do you think about that? And so, and I, I can't believe it. Like, it was funny. I, I won an award about, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. And I ended up putting that in my speech because it was sort of like, that's what made me ask myself, what do I think about that? And sometimes I remember like, as I got a little older, I would well, I would change. My mind would change. She would show me an article about something similar. And only a few years ago, I thought this about that topic, right? And then I would change my mind. Um, and she never argued with me. She never told me what to think. She just asked me what I thought about it. And critical thinking is, is probably the most, I think, the most important skill we can have, especially in a world with so much media to consume. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, we at... at since we started the, 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 the Reading With Your Kids podcast five years ago, I've been uh, pre I, probably preaching is the right word that when you ask your kids what they think, whether it's you're asking your middle grade kids what they think about a newspaper article or whether you're asking your five year old what they think um, about Tommy having vanilla ice cream instead of chocolate, it's empowering. It's hugely empowering. And okay, so this connects with some of my work that I do with young people. When I talk a lot about emotions to young people, especially if I do writing workshops. So I introduce them to, um, there's a really wonderful uh, visual that I fell in love with years ago and, and wrote a, a, a different book about um, that came out last year. But Robert Plutchik was a, a psychologist in, in the 20th century, and he invented the emotion wheel. It's actually becoming quite popular these days, and you can see it around the place. Very colorful. Um, and it's great. So I go into schools and I show them the wheel and they're like, oh, that's interesting. Because immediately for me, it helps as well. It, it, it makes emotions science. That's incredibly important because emotions are science. There are people, there are scientists who study emotions, right? But the first question I ask them is, first I ask them how, what, to write down what they're feeling. But then I ask them what they're angry about. And I think that that feeling that we were talking about in a minute ago, like first you're distracted by this, let's say, blacked out piece, right? But then once you find out what it is, you do feel like somebody didn't want you to see that. So you feel a little bit cheeky for finding it out, mm -hmm. I'm sure. But you also probably, uh, especially in the case of this book, feel like, wait a second, why were they hiding that from me? That doesn't make any sense. And then you feel like somebody didn't trust you. 
And then that does lead to a very familiar feeling for not just kids, <laughs> but especially when you are a kid, um, where you really feel, like I said, underestimated and, mm-hmm. and sort of um, like people don't really see how smart you are. Mm-hmm. And all they want you to do is, is be clever and be smart and creative and all these things that we push and we want our kids to be. And at the same time, we're like, oh, no, don't give them that concept or what, you know, all these other things. And at the same time, that's also overlooking what society is already showing them. If you have a television on in your house, <laughs> your kids are already seeing so many things, whether it's ads for tonight's prime time, whether, uh, you know, whether it's ads themselves. Um, and, you know, and then we have social media and these sorts of things. So depending on the age, um, kids are exposed to so many things to take from them concepts that are given in a, how do I say, writing is that it's a slower way it's a slower absorb absorption i think Mm -hmm. um and 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 you're also more engaged because as a reader you become you become completely allied with the protagonist and so you're you know in there too and so when someone underestimates you or your protagonist you feel hurt Mm -hmm. it's hurtful Mm -hmm. and so i find that those emotions that um are, are actually the most powerful things we walk with it's the reason i'm a writer and it's the reason I think every every writer I know is a writer. We pay attention to these things um, when most of our childhoods and and beyond were filled with people telling us to not pay attention to our emotions, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Um, the the whole concept is interesting when, when we when we take things away from young people. Mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I it it's um, th- there's so much to to dive into there before we go any further though I, I i do want to play devil's advocate in a way because for me anytime there was something that my kids were interested in that i was kind of like eh, mm-hmm. i i i had the benefit of of a lot of things i had the benefit of that nun who taught me hey sit down and read it with your kid i had the benefit of the fact that i spent 10 years or so as a social worker talking about things with kids and my wife is a teacher and so we had this experience and background and I'm a dopey guy who gets up on stage and does magic in front of thousands of people you know so embarrassing I'm paid to be embarrassed but there are a lot of people out there who don't have that same kind of background and there's a lot of stuff that makes them uncomfortable I've recently saw something on um uh, on one of the news channels, and it's uh, talking about this book that was the way they described it was it sounded very pornographic, um, and it was a picture book for kids. It had a lot of LGBTQ um, kind of themes in it, and, and it's like, well, and the presenter was saying this is being um, this is being put in elementary schools, and I'm thinking second and third graders. I I don't know if I had the whole story. But at the same time, it's like going, I don't want to censor things. I don't think it works. But at the same time, is an elementary school library necessarily appropriate for something like that? Well, I want to backtrack and and try and figure out what you meant by pairing pornographic with LGBTQ+. Those two things don't connect. No, no, I I wasn't making it. This was at the presenter. Okay. The characters were involved, and um, the characters involved were members of that community, and they were involved right. in very, you know, graphic, intimate relations. Oh wow! Okay, that would I wouldn't I wouldn't think there's a picture book around um, for young people for that. Absolutely, with that in it. Um, so when it comes to elementary schools, that kind of thing, I don't believe literature has been that you just described or that they described. Mm-hmm. You'll say that you heard. Um, exists. Um, as for uh, graphic novels meant for teenagers and adults, um, I mean, I've read graphic memoir that has um, pretty uh, explicit, you mm-hmm. know, um, like illustration. And I think, well, you know, this is where we get into some of the research I do as a volunteer and as in, in sort of my other parts of my job. We have to kind of come to a place, I think, as a society where we realize that no matter how much we limit our kids' exposure or connection, right, to the Internet and uh, phone screens, et cetera, that the average age 
of seeing actual live action, <clears throat> pardon me, pornography um, on the internet is 10, mm -hmm. right? So I, I was 10 in third grade. Um, and I think one of the things that's interesting about, about that is that we are, you know, we're, we're concerned about books while we think that because my kid doesn't have a phone, they can't see this. Because my kid has only uses a school computer, they can't see this. That, you know, I didn't know because I am 52 years old. I'm old. I remember phones on walls. And mm -hmm. in fact, I, I, I'm used to that still. But I didn't know that you could connect to the internet on every single gaming platform, Xbox, all that stuff. I also didn't realize how many friends have phones that can and, and can you know, show and watch and this sort of thing, whether it's just a racy TikTok or it's what I was just discussing, mm -hmm. like more, more you know, serious stuff. I wonder how many people are having conversations with their with their kids about that mm -hmm. and saying, you know, it is out there because if you don't tell them it's out there they're going to find it and not tell you. And then you can't have the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I say this from experience, although mm -hmm. I did, I was told and I did have the conversation. Um, and it's an incredibly important conversation to have because many studies have proven over many years that it's quite a dangerous thing to watch too much of that or to believe that it's actually real. Mm -hmm. um, but getting back to books, books have always been a safer place to learn about the realities of the world. Um, again, I don't think a picture book um, has that type of illustration in it. Um, I do know that there are graphic, a few graphic novels that do, um, but again, for an older audience. Mm -hmm. um, and we do need to understand these categorizations. It's one of those, it's one of those things that, that I guess library and author and publishing people understand the difference between each little category. Mm -hmm. But out here as consumers, we don't. Um, but I also think that... Um, Hmm. Yeah, I think that that when it comes to things like sex or sexuality, a book is a really good place to learn about those things. But again, for younger for younger kids, I don't think those exist. For right. older kids, I think it's a I think it's actually a really interesting I think it's an interesting way to be able to get the information that mom and dad can't tell you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, they because they don't have the experience. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I couldn't talk to my to my kids about um about plenty of things that I haven't experienced. So I, I think I think it's important. And I think the conversation like you were talking about before is really important because then if you have an open a place for open conversation, your kid can say, hey, I'm feeling uncomfortable about this book. And you'd be like, oh yeah, what are you uncomfortable about? And they can say, look at this. And you go, hmm, well, if that makes you uncomfortable, put it down. And then have a conversation about why. Mm -hmm. um, but we all also know in this business and you know, library business and teaching business is that young people self-censor. It's, mm -hmm. it's just what you do. I think, I think we all do. If we don't mm -hmm. like a thing, we turn it off mm -hmm. and we put it down. Um, so, you know, what do I think about that? I don't think that what you described or what that person described uh, exists. What a, I think that that books are still the best way to ingest uncomfortable information, whether it be about sexuality or war or, you know, um, or anything like that. It's just we don't tend to censor things that are violent. We only censor things that um, that I don't know that that feel what I says sex feels wronger for children than violence. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to say. Yeah. You know, I think this brings up, and, and I'm, I really love that we're able to have this conversation and dig deeper. I think this brings up uh, something that we, we touched on earlier is that kids and adults, we have access to all of this information right now. And there's a really good chance that the person I was listening to was talking about a graphic novel and chose to describe it as a picture book to inflame the audience. Absolutely. You know, and, and I think that that's, again, it's a conversation. These are conversations that we have to have with our kids so that they can discern. So when they are hearing somebody being outraged about something that they can dig deeper Absolutely. I mean, right now there's a lot of words being thrown around. So you actually used the word pornographer, which is why I said, hold it, let's clarify. And that is a really great um, clue. If you're listening to somebody talking about literature in any way and they use that word, that's a clue that maybe they are throwing incendiary things around in order to um, do the opposite of what my mother did. Right. She's mm -hmm. not asking anyone what they think. 
And, 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 and you can't ask someone what they think about two panels or four panels in a graphic novel. You must read and see it in context and understand why it's there. You may still feel completely like, nope, this scene shouldn't have been included. And that is you, absolutely, you're right to do that. But you know, right now we're hyper-focusing on a panel or a, a certain scene or whatever it is. And then suddenly the word pornography or pornographer comes out. And, you know, in a country where there are bona fide legitimate pornographers, you know, I really think that the, the more we, we confuse these words, um, the more we confuse these words, the more we're actually doing a disservice to children mm-hmm. because more and more um, <laughs> educators are coming up against that word for simply having books that, don't, that aren't even anything like the description that mm-hmm. we're talking about now, right? Um, and so I completely forgot the origin of your question. <laughs> well, what were we talking about? Well, no, it was just talking about um, just devil's advocate because yeah. it's like, yeah, yeah. we want to we want to be able to. Yeah. Like I said, I am able to have these conversations with my kids. I had conversations mm-hmm. about pornography when my kid was accessing it when he was, I, I think, eight or nine years old. And it's like, yeah. and I had every super blocking software mm-hmm. on my, and he was able to get around it. Um, yeah. And and yeah. uh, but but there are a lot of folks who who can't, and there are a lot of folks who don't well, want to. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think I think the number one thing um, I guess to to note here is that we have to remember that most people don't read the books, mm-hmm. full books from beginning to end, um, when they're complaining about them. Most of the time, they haven't read the book. Um, the letters I get that say, uh, you know, I think that your book is this. I haven't read it, but I heard from someone else, you know, um, and, I'm, and I'm concerned. And it's not this book. I mean, other books. Right. But, um, but I think we have to realize that critical thinking is at an all-time low in some spots. So every single time, I mean, it's, it's critical thinking isn't something that stops when we're 18. Although this is the, thing, the, the definition of adulthood that's been modeled for young people. This is another thing I talk about with young people. I tell you, know, we always leave our, our inner teen behind. The minute we turn 20, we're like, ugh, teenagers, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, you know, we're modeling this sort of, I have ideas, I vote this way, you know, this is what I think, I'm an adult. And then we don't change our minds um, because that makes us weak. Um, and this is something that, that I've, I've watched people that I thought were going to, you know, I don't know, people in my generation, and I've watched people just sort of stagnate in that. Um, so, you know, I think every single time, especially as parents now, especially with a lot of political rhetoric um, and, and politics coming into, our, into our, our education systems, I think that we need to make sure that we remember that our kids are incredibly savvy incredibly creative and smart and capable of handling a lot of conversations that we ourselves feel uncomfortable inside of. Um, And taking something away, like you said before, immediately draws attention to it. Um, Mm. But, you know, I am, I'm, I will go back to the interesting thing that you, that, that this person that you said was speaking connected, which was the idea of pornography and the idea of the LGBTQ IA plus community. And that is, that is um, discriminatory and wrong. Um, mm-hmm. You can't really do that in your, if, if you don't believe that's fine, you can have, but have a conversation mm-hmm. with your kids versus sort of being like pretending it doesn't exist. They are going to go out into the world one day and they are going to meet people. And I suppose the bottom line for me is when they meet new people, when they go out into the world, do you want them to hate them? Or do you want them to love them? Do you want them to love first or hate first? That's that's my biggest thing. And I, w- I wanted my kids to love first mm-hmm. and and go from there. And if someone gives you a reason to to need, you know, to distance yourself from them, do it with grace. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and that's the I suppose it, it goes the same for books. Yeah. <laughs> if we could if we could say that's not for me mm-hmm. versus this is pornographic and no one should read it. Mm-hmm. That's com- two completely different things. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that we've uh, that I taught my kids when they were young is the only thing I think we should be teaching our kids when it comes to others is that every person deserves to be loved, respected, and included. Yes. No matter what. Yes. And right now, that same kind of thing that we were just talking about, there are um, all are welcome signs and flags being pulled from teachers' doors 
and, and people are complaining about the phrase, all are welcome on a sign. Now, there might be some graphics around that sign. Maybe there's a rainbow flag. Maybe there is, um, there is sort of, I can't remember what I saw. I saw like there are little hearts with different skin colors, we'll say, different mm -hmm. to all the different range of colors for skin. And those are, <clears throat> are being, um, those are being, I won't say outlawed, but like removed from mm -hmm. schools. And when we're removing the idea that all are welcome, then that's when we need to rethink, <laughs> rethink our direction, I think, yeah. you know, because yeah. everybody is worthy of love and respect. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and one of the things that, that Amy and I connected with before we started recording is the fact that we both have connections with the circus. And the circus, I think, is one of those places. It's not a perfect world, but it's one of those places where we see a diverse cast of characters with, with diverse, you know, diverse backgrounds, diverse uh, skills and talents. And yet we all come together to, to work together to put on a show, a show where all are welcome. And, sure. um, and, and the circus is one of those places, at least most circuses, one of those places where, you know, the, the star that's up on the high wire um, is probably going to be packing up his or her equipment at night and loading it up and is not going to have a crew of roadies do it for them. That's right. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And I think it's interesting because I sometimes having known like European circus is interesting because of course you're going to have different nationalities. So you have all these different languages flying around, all these different things, all these different smells at dinner time. So, you know, all these things. Right. And I think when I go into school, sometimes that's how it feels, you know, depending on where I am, it's it's the same thing. I, I don't know. And when I think about even when I hang out with my author friends, we come from all different backgrounds and we have so many different things to offer young readers. And I think that's that's you know it's important. And so when I see my friends books um, be challenged or banned or things like this, it it blows my mind. And when, when I, I didn't even tell you this, but when Matt, the, the Devil's Arithmetic, the book that gets censored in the mm -hmm. in my book, um, this actually happened to my son at school. Um, and the parts that were censored out in the in my book are the same parts that were censored out in his book. And I didn't know Jane Yolen then. And I can't say Jane's my friend. I can definitely say she's my acquaintance now. I can't wait to call her a friend. But what a fabulous woman who has a career of more than 400 beautiful books for young people. Um, and, you know, when I think that somebody censored that specific part of her book, it's like it's like people got up and walked out in the middle of, you know, the contortionist act mm -hmm. or, you know, or something like this. It doesn't make any sense, you know. And if you think about when you have to go to the bathroom during the circus and you come back, you're like, what did I miss? Mm -hmm. And that's what I think about about black rectangles. Right. Or, you know, or, or what's missing from our stacks. What did I miss? Mm -hmm. And I think it's important. I mean, if, if especially right now, there's a real push as well to take away actual factually proven history mm -hmm. out of our history books. How does that serve a child? I, I cannot find out how that serves a child. It, um, they will find out eventually. And when they, if they find out too late, they're going to be confused as to why. Yeah. And, and if they find out that you intentionally hid the information from them, they're going to resent you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's, that's why, I mean, conversation is everything. And, and I think that's the one thing about parenting that I think my kids got real sick of, you know, hey, let's have a chat. Oh, they couldn't stand the word chat to this day. <laughs> my son's like, oh, God, you said chat. I'm like, I know. I'm sorry. It's not a big thing. But let's just have this conversation. Um, and I try not to go on too long. I always do. But we end up having good conversations because I end up asking, what do you think about that? And yeah. I tell them how to think, you know. Yeah. So important. Yeah. And you'll be happy to know that Jane was a guest on our podcast, and I had an absolutely magical time speaking with her. She is just, she did a, so the audio book for this book, for Attack of the Black Rectangles, is fantastic. And Jane has cameo in it because Mac writes Jane a letter um, to tell her what's happening. And um, she also makes an appearance in the book as well. Um, but she is on the audiobook reading her letter, and it, Every time 
it makes me it makes me absolutely cry. Like if I was an actor and I needed a crying scene and I just couldn't work a cry up, all I would have to do is listen to that minute and a half of audio. <laughs> She's just there's something about her voice and something about her experience that comes out in her voice, which is yet another reason why it's just so it, it blew my mind when I figured out what the words were crossed out in real life. I mean, yeah. you know, that's it blew my mind so that somebody so I don't know experienced and knowledgeable and helpful to young people yeah. would be censored. That's, it, it, it is um, baffling, mm-hmm. baffling. Uh, Sarah, excuse me, Amy, where can people go to find out more about you and to find out more about Attack of the Black Rectangles? Well, um, they can go to my website, which is as. Dot, well, sorry, let's start that again, as-king.com. Um, you can also go to Scholastic. Uh, teachers or educators or, hey, anybody who wants parents, uh, on my website, there's an area called resources. Um, and you can download, I think it's six uh, worksheets that are like activities mm-hmm. to do with your kids and with your students if you read the book aloud or if they re- if you read it as a class. Um, so that's there. Other than that, you can find me at, at Scholastic as well. So um that's how you find the book. And I, I'm about to go on the road. So if you're in, let's see, Atlanta or Houston or the Phoenix area or the D.C. area um, or the Philadelphia area, check out my website. You'll see my tour dates and you'll see when I'm going to be around. Awesome. We've had a great time speaking about a really powerful, important uh, middle grade novel, Attack of the Black Rectangles. And we've also talked about the importance of reading with our kids, continuing to read with our kids and have conversations with our kids about media that might make you uncomfortable. But in the long run, it's going to make you very much closer to your kids. Absolutely. Our guest has been Amy Sarig King. Amy, thanks so much for being here. Ted, this was awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Molly Idol. She'll be here to celebrate her beautiful picture book, Witch Hazel. That's the next episode of the podcast. Hey, if you're the author of a fantastic children's book, we would love to help you celebrate your book. There's so many ways we can help you celebrate your book to the world. You can be a guest here on the podcast. You can be part of our Certified Great Read program. You can also take part in our monthly promotion program. You can learn all about these opportunities and more by going to our website, readingwithyourkids.com and clicking the Authors Click Here button at the top of the page. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Chris, I want to start by thanking our guest, Amy Sarah King. Please be sure to check out Attack of the Black Rectangles. I also want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Mirabella Q. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. I want to thank my awesome son, Christopher, for allowing me to use his studio down here in Orlando. But most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.